This is a late night update on Russian military operations in Ukraine for June 28th, 2022. Uh, let's just jump right into it. There's a lot going on, uh, a lot changing on the battlefield, also a lot changing politically, diplomatically, even economically. Let's take a look at the battlefield. This is a pro-Ukrainian map. Even this pro-Ukrainian map is painting a bleak picture for Ukraine. Now, I'm gonna talk about Kherson, this uh, formerly Ukrainian city in the south. Uh, Russia has consolidated control over it. It's part of this uh, land bridge that connects Crimea to the Donbas region and then the border with the Russian Federation. Uh, so from here all the way to the Donbas region, this is what Russia controls and even part of Kharkov Oblast. Now, the main focus of Russian forces right now is to secure the Donbas region. They have Lugansk uh, almost completely taken. Donetsk, if you look here, this gray dotted line, uh, this, this, all of this territory in here, Russia still needs to take. This is going to take some time and it's going to be hard fighting. Fighting in urban areas is very difficult. Uh, but right now, Severodonetsk, completely taken by Russia. Everything on this side of the river taken by Russia. Uh, they're, you know, again, this is a pro-Ukrainian map, so they're going to hold off to the last minute to show just how encircled Lizichansk is. But it is, uh, according to other maps, pro-Russian maps, Russian forces are much closer, if not already, inside Lizichansk. This is uh, unfolding very quickly. Once that is done, Russian forces are going to be focusing on, this is actually like a, a, like a ring almost, of industrial and urban uh, areas all, all along here from Slav uh, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, and it stretches down southward uh, all the way to Donetsk. Th that is going to be the next uh, fight for Russia in the Donbas region. And I would say these will all be heavily fortified. Bakhmu is heavily fortified. It is going to take Russia time to do this. They're taking their time to conserve their manpower and their equipment. They're, they're moving methodically, systematically, patiently across the battlefield, uh, just dismantling Ukrainian forces. Ukraine is throwing absolutely everything they have at Russia. Russia is conserving themselves and doing this very slowly. Time is on their side. They have, they're have not in a rush for anything. There's nothing that they're rushing to, to do. They're just doing what they have to do as quickly as they can do it without losing huge amounts of men and machines. It's, uh, to a certain extent, a war of attrition. And if Ukraine is throwing everything they have at Russia, losing 100, 200 men a day dead, hundreds injured, likely out of the fight for good, and all of their equipment, they're going to lose the war. They're going to lose the war. Uh, so. That is the situation in the Donbas region and then northeast Kharkov uh, again. Russia just continues pounding this entire area with artillery, with rockets, with missiles. And they're not even trying to take Kharkov at this point. The, again, the main focus is on the Donbas region. Uh, Russian forces outside of Kharkov or consolidated control over Kherson in the south. Uh, they're holding those positions. Some of them are conducting fixing operations where they can afford to lose territory, take it back, push and pull with the enemy as long as they keep the enemy tied up there. That, that is the point of a fixing operation. This is what's going on along the front. The heavy fighting and all of the Russian gains are taking place in the Donbas region. Nobody can deny this, not even... Uh, not even the Pentagon. Let's look at this. U.S. Department of Defense senior defense official holds a background briefing June 27, 2022. Okay, so for this briefing, this Pentagon briefing, they talk about the HIMARS, these multiple launch rocket systems that the U.S. has sent. They've sent four of them. The Pentagon acknowledges that they're in the hands of the Ukrainians. They're using them on the battlefield right now. I haven't heard of any tide changing because of it. They say four more are being sent to Ukraine. And I don't know how quickly that will happen, but here's what to look out for. Will Russia find and destroy these four HIMARS the US already sent before the next four arrive? And if they lose any HIMARS between now and the, the, the next set arriving, then this is 
the U.S. just barely able to keep four HIMARS on the battlefield, let alone build up a, a significant number necessary to make any sort of noticeable difference on the battlefield. Uh, now, here's the problem. They're not just sending HIMARS to Ukraine. They have to train all of the crews, every single crew for the HIMARS. Ukraine has never used these before. And so every single HIMARS that is sent, they have to train a crew along with that that, that could take a month to do. And that is not optimal either. That is cutting corners and uh, watering down the training necessary to use these systems. The Pentagon admits that uh, Russia has taken Severodonetsk. Yes, they, they've uh, done that. They also launched, Russia launched 60 missiles, including at the capital, Kiev, Lvov, and Odessa. And the Pentagon was asked, and they said they didn't know what the targets were that Russia was hitting. Their mili it's military infrastructure. It's part of uh, the industrial base of Ukraine to, to produce munitions and also places where munitions sent by the West are being stored. The senior defense official says, Near Kherson in the south, we're aware of growing indications of resistance against the Russian occupation. Over the last several days, we've become aware of assassinations of local Russian officials. And that's not resistance, that's terrorism. And that's being carried out by Ukrainian military personnel infiltrating into the area. It's not a resist, that's not resistance. There are no signs of actual resistance in Kherson or any of the other areas held by Russian forces. This is the Pentagon trying to spin terrorist attacks into some sort of resistance. That's not happening. It's not. It's also not something that, even if it were happening, would be something that Russia is not able to overcome. They overcame it in Chechnya. Uh, there was two. There were two wars, late 90s, early 2000s, and then uh, insurgency. They were able to end the insurgency and uh, now uh, people from Chechnya in Russia I mean they're some of the the fiercest fighters most loyal citizens of the Russian Federation so I, I think Russia will be able to handle the territory in Ukraine which which had been territory of Russia previously in history I think they're going to be able to do this now there's questions from the media and the senior defense official is asked how long can Russia maintain this level of combat power. And he says, if you just look on paper, the Russians certainly have an advantage that relates to munition systems and likely total numbers of troops that they can put on the field. That is true. And then he starts talking about uh, comparing that to the Ukrainian soldiers' will to fight, which is totally irrelevant. It's like having a will to punch through a one foot thick sheet of steel and the actual ability to do it, I mean, with your bare hand. You're not going to be able to do it. And uh, Ukrainian soldiers might have the will to keep fighting Russia, the su superior force in numbers, in uh, military strength, but they just aren't going to be able to. I mean, I mean, there's certain metrics that negate your will to fight. Now, another question regarding Severodonetsk. The senior defense official was asked by the media whether or not Russia could exploit this. Uh, could they exploit this victory or would they have to regroup? Because what everyone in the Western media does at these briefings is try to find anything that could be even vaguely uh, interpreted as Russia's combat power diminishing. Because they can see that Russia is winning. They can see it. They can see them making advances on the battlefield. They want to know, you know, when are they going to run out of men, tanks? bullets, rockets, artillery shells, and uh, this is what the senior defense official says in response. In most cases, the Ukrainians are leaving those locations of their accord, not necessarily because the Russians have made them, but because they are choosing to move to positions of greater advantage, and the cost is pretty significant for the Russians. I think we'll see that continue. Only. It's, there is there is no heavy cost for Russia. Russia is going slow. Everyone keeps saying how slow Russia is going. They're going slow specifically to minimize their own losses, maximize the losses of the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have admitted how high their losses are. So you're losing more soldiers, more equipment in, in these uh, stand and fight orders that the Ukrainian soldiers are getting. And then they're falling back because 
they're being dis you know, being annihilated on the battlefield. Uh, that's not that's not smart defense. That's not a defense that is making Russia pay. That is a defense where you're you're annihilating your army, and you're falling back because you you physically cannot stay in Severodonetsk. Severodonetsk was surrounded. It was surrounded. They were being cut off. They were in one tiny area, a corner of the city, the industrial area, and they were being surrounded just like the militants in Mariupol were at Azovstal Steelworks. So, and, and there weren't many left either. And so that they're, they're losing, they're just losing. This is the Pentagon, the Western media. I'm gonna show you some other articles from the Western media. This is them all trying to spin this as if somehow Ukraine is not losing even when so clearly they're losing. Uh, the media and also this senior defense official, they repeatedly go to these claims about Russian generals being killed, Russian generals being dismissed, low morale across uh, Russian ranks. And where are they getting these rumors from? Where are they coming from? They come from the Ukrainian intelligence directorate which is just war propaganda. They're not, they're not giving you real intel. It's just like the CIA or MI6. Their, their job is to manipulate the public. They falsify information. They put it out there to serve the interests of their respective governments. That is what Ukrainian intelligence services also do. And that's what they're doing when they're saying, oh, you know, all of these Russian generals are dying or being dismissed. I mean, what? Who's still leading the Russian military and, and enabling them to defeat Ukraine on the battlefield? As a matter of fact, uh, the more they try to make Russia look incompetent, uh, their forces uh, falling apart, disintegrating, and yet we still see them winning on the battlefield, it's, it's not very flattering to Ukrainian forces, Ukrainian troops, it's military. Let's move on to uh, this article. This is a this is a good one. It's by uh, Aust Australian Major General Mick Ryan. It's titled "Ukraine's Tactical Realignment in the East Isn't a Sign It's Losing the War Against Russia." Uh, but it, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously it is. It's them losing. It's them losing. They. This is what happened to them in Mariupol. They lost at Mariupol. It was not a tactical retreat. That was them losing. They were going to lose again in Severodonetsk. And uh, I think some of them did manage to get out in time, or else it would have been another Mariupol, another Azovstal Steelworks. Now, like I said, this article is written by Australian Major General Mick Ryan, and he starts out with all of these analogies to other wars where things started out very poorly, but then at the end, uh, they won. You know, different points in World War II where it seemed bleak, but eventually the UK pulled it off. He says, we may never know just how many Russians and Ukrainians have been killed in action or wounded, but given Ukrainian casualty figures of 100 to 200 killed per day, we should expect it to be in the thousands. The uh, Ukrainian high command, while its soldiers fight and die in the east, have had to make hard decisions about the continued defense of Severodonetsk. There has been significant political pressure to stay in the city, and that is the reason they stayed in the city, purely for political reasons, nothing else. At the same time, the Ukrainians needed their forces to stay long enough to cause enough destruction to Russian first echelon forces and reserves. Now, if you're losing more troops than the, the army you're fighting, more equipment than the army you're fighting, then that, that strategy makes no sense. You're just losing. That's what that is. You're just losing. Uh, General Ryan also says, This week, the Ukrainian High Command made the decision to withdraw its forces from Severodonetsk to previously prepared defensive positions further to the west. Seeding ground in the east by Ukraine is a tactical realignment. It is not the same as Ukraine is losing the war as some have cast the events of uh, the last few weeks. Now, it actually is Ukraine losing the war. They are being pushed out of everywhere. They are not winning anywhere. That is called losing. I, you know, I don't know what else you could call it. He also says, it is simply part of war's nature as humans seek to impose their will on each other. War has many twists and turns. Well, let's talk about the nature of this specific warfare in the Donbas region. 
uh, he's saying it, others are saying it, you know, Russia is going so slow. I, I already talked about this. Russia is going so slow. Russia is going so slow because of the specific nature of the warfare. Eight years, Ukraine built up these defenses. Again, look at the footage coming out of the Donbas region. There's networks of trenches, tunnels, bunkers, fortified bunkers made out of concrete, permanent installations. Uh, this is what Ukraine did over the last eight years. That will take time to bombard, to encircle, to cut off from their from being resupplied, uh, wearing them down, and then storming into these fortifications. It takes a long time. It's very hard to do, and that's just the the nature of this battle. You don't go sweeping across. No army in the world has the ability to sweep across the fences like those built by Ukraine over the last eight years in the Donbas region. Now, he also says, while the Ukrainians have been fighting in the south, east, and north of Kharkiv, they have also been redeveloping their logistics system around the NATO model and rearming with long-range fires. This will stand them in good steed for the fighting ahead. But it is an ongoing challenge. But actually, no. No, it isn't. They had all of these Soviet-era weapons and weapons that they developed their own. Ukraine had a formidable military-industrial complex and industrial base. Uh, all of that is gone. In, again, incorporating NATO systems could take years to do effectively, as effectively as they'll have to use them in order to defeat Russia. So they don't have that kind of time. And so what is he talking about? Also, does NATO even have the numbers that Ukraine requires to gain any sort of parity with Russia on the battlefield? And that looks like the answer is no. So far, it's no. Sending eight HIMARS to Ukraine when Russia has hundreds of multiple launch rocket systems, the Iskander missile system, uh, all of its aviation, warplanes, helicopters. They have all of this at their disposal what is how is eight HIMARS going to make a difference on the battlefield it's not going to and there's no indication that they're going to significantly ramp up the flow and again it's it's all dependent on training the crews for four weeks for each crew think about that so then he ends his article uh talking about different military leaders in history who suffered defeat in the beginning but eventually were victorious in their respective wars and then he says this week's events have shown again that losing territory is bad for a country at war but losing your army is fatal the ukrainians have had a terrible week but it is not the same as them losing the war they are losing territory and their army at the same time that is what's happening and you know it's funny in his article he never defines what losing actually is he never defines that so that you could compare and contrast what he's claiming is happening in Ukraine. He never does that because then you'd have to face the fact that, yes, actually Ukraine is losing. Here's another one from Sky News. Is Russia now winning the war in Ukraine? Experts have their say. And, you know, when you got all articles uh, like this one trying to say, no, they're, even though it really looks like they're losing, they're not. Is Russia now winning the war in Ukraine? When you have articles like this coming out, it's, it's because the Ukrainians are losing. That's that is the reason why. So the first the first expert that they talk to, Sky News, is Sir Richard Barons. He's a former head of the Joint Forces Command, and he says Russia will feel it's sitting on now just a bit less than a quarter of Ukraine. It knows that Ukraine does not have the military capability to throw them out, and it will sense that there is some weariness in the world at bearing the consequences of this war. There's also limitations being exposed that even if they even if the west had the will to do some of these things they just don't have the means to do it he then says territory in the southern belt has also been consolidated by russia while militarily there have there has been progress moscow is aware that strategically it will lose that war says sir richard it's been isolated from the international community no, it hasn't. It has been isolated from just the West. The West is not the international community. Uh, it's a pariah state. Its economy will shrink by maybe 15% this year. And if Ukraine is enabled to re-equip and rearm, then Ukraine will reverse the military tide in due course and start to throw the Russians out. No, it will not, because while Russia's economy is going to contract by 15%, there will be nothing left of the Ukrainian 
economy. And look at what's happening to the West because of their sanctions backfiring on them. What's going to be left of their economies? And then he's saying re-equipping Ukraine. Again, I've said this many times. I'm going to continue saying it. Others are now starting to say this, it, you know, later on in this article and in a CNN article that I'm going to go over, that you can have the amount of equipment required for a brigade, a Ukrainian brigade, and you could bring in the number of men you need for a brigade. You cannot just put those men on that equipment and send it to the battlefield. They need to be trained. And not all of them are going to be just entry-level infantrymen or operators. You also need to have uh, low, medium, and high-level leadership, which takes years to develop that Ukraine simply does not have. That's a fact. This was the same problem the U.S. had standing up the, you know, the free Syrian army in Syria. They're trying to build an army out of thin air, and that's simply not possible. You cannot build an army out of thin air and have it go fight a, an established army with a pipeline for men, munitions, leadership, everything. Uh, you cannot just do that. It doesn't work that way. It's not a movie. So then uh, Sky News asks, former chief of the general staff, General Lord Richard Dannett, he says, there will come a time in the not too distant future when the Russians will have got control of those two Donbas provinces, which is what their strategic game currently is. Now the West can tell the Russians they've got to go. The Russians will not go voluntarily. And who is going to make them go? NATO's not going to launch an operation to throw them out. So there may be a new reality whereby part of sovereign Ukraine territory remains occupied by Russians for quite some time, and I would say indefinitely. And that pretty much sums up the reality of the situation in Ukraine. So again, this is Sky News. Uh, finally, at least someone that they interviewed says something sensible and realistic and rooted in reality. There's only one way for Ukraine to turn the tide, and that is if NATO intervened. And like I said, the most likely scenario for a NATO intervention would be entering in the West, creating a buffer zone uh, well away from Russian forces and trying to do that to preserve at least part of Ukraine. What will be left of Ukraine is this landlocked, dysfunctional, failed state that is going to be a burden for the US and the EU indefinitely. There will be nothing that can be done to rehabilitate what is left of Ukraine. It's, it's best and brightest are all going to be gone. They will have no resources. They will likely not even have access to the sea. Now there's this one from CNN. Saving the best for last. Biden officials privately doubt that Ukraine can win back all of its territory. Uh, nothing could be more obvious. Um, I'm glad someone is finally saying it uh, across the Western media. So it says White House officials are losing confidence that Ukraine will ever be able to take back all of the land it has lost to Russia over the last four months of war. U.S. officials told CNN, even with the heavier and more sophisticated weaponry, the U.S. and its allies plan to send. This is what I've been saying for weeks now. Well, all along, really. And I was told that I was a Russian propagandist. Now this is the, the White House, White House officials telling CNN this same obvious reality. Advisors to President Joe Biden have begun debating internally how and whether Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky should shift his definition of a Ukrainian victory, adjusting for the possibility that his country has shrunk irreversibly. Again, this is what I have said. Almost every single update I have said that Ukraine has no possibility of even bringing this to a stalemate if they want to save their country's territorial integrity or what is left of it they need to go to the negotiation table essentially surrender and hope that russia allows them to keep part of their country and it's funny the only way that ukraine is going to be preserved is if ukraine comes to its senses and talks with russia not if it continues turning to the west for help because the west is more than happy to try to bleed Russia to the very last Ukrainian and the very last square meter of Ukrainian territory. Uh, now, here's, here's, you know, so they, the article is mostly sensible, but they have to throw something in there uh, that is ridiculous. A congressional aide familiar with the deliberations told CNN that a smaller Ukrainian state is not inevitable. 
it already is smaller and there's territory that Russia has taken that is most certainly never going back to Ukraine. So this is pure fantasy territory that we're in here. Whether Ukraine can take back these territories is in large part, if not entirely, a function of how much support we give them, the aide said. He noted that Ukraine has formally asked the US for a minimum of 48 multiple launch rocket systems, HIMARS or M270s, uh, but to date uh, has only been promised eight from the Pentagon. And that eight is not going to remain eight for long. Russia will find them and destroy them. It will be less than eight very soon. Just wait. And not everyone in the administration is as worried. Some believe Ukrainian forces could again defy expectations as they did in the early days of the war when they repelled a Russian advance on the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has remained highly engaged with his Ukrainian counterparts and spent hours on the phone last week discussing Ukrainian efforts to recapture territory with Ukraine's defense chief and chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff General Mark Milley, officials familiar with the call, told CNN. But again, Ukraine didn't defy any expectations. In the opening phases of Russia's military operations in Ukraine, they sought to shock Ukraine into surrendering. They rushed at every single population center. Some of them folded, like Kherson. Uh, some of them uh, were surrounded, like Mariupol. And some of them fought back, like Kiev and Kharkov. Uh, Ukrainian forces stood and fought. If the decision was made to stand and fight and not surrender in those, those early days of the military operation, there was no way that the forces Russia sent outside those cities would be able to encircle them, let alone take those cities. It was impossible. So there was nothing that Ukraine did to defy expectations. The expectations were the, f the forces would not fight at all. They would fold. Uh, in some places they did, in others they did not. Russia didn't expect them to fold in every single city. It was a gamble and it paid off in certain areas and, and it didn't pan out in others. As soon as Ukraine was fighting in and around Kiev or outside Kharkov, Russia knew that it was not going to be able to take either of those cities. Uh, so what they did was fix those Ukrainian forces in place while they consolidated control over southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine. That is what led to all of the victories that we're talking about today uh, in Mariupol and uh, the encirclement and destruction of Ukrainian forces in the Donbass. That was because Russia divided their forces up, Ukrainian forces up, uh, and they were consolidating control over the rest of the country. If Russia just sent all of its forces to the south or to the east, all of Ukraine's forces would be sent there also, and it would be a much bigger and bloodier battle. Ukraine didn't defy anything. Every single place where Russia went and focused its forces on, they have won. That is the point. They did not focus all of their forces on Kiev or Kharkov. Not yet. When they do, they will win. They will take those cities. Uh, if Ukrainian forces defeated Russia at Mariupol, or stop them at Severodonetsk, then we could say, well, Ukrainians are defying the odds. But they didn't, they lost in both cases. They will continue to lose. Uh, when Russia focuses its forces on an objective, they will take it. Ukraine has not been able to stop them. That is the reality. Now the article comes back to reality. They say the mood has shifted over the last several weeks though, as Ukraine has struggled to repel Russia's advances in the Donbas and has suffered staggering troop losses, reaching as many as 100 soldiers per day. Ukrainian forces are also burning through their equipment and ammunition faster than the West can provide and train them on new NATO standard weapon systems. A U.S. military official and a source familiar with Western intelligence agreed it was unlikely that Ukraine would be able to mass the force necessary to reclaim all of the territory lost to Russia during the fighting, especially this year, as Zelensky said on Monday, was his goal. A substantial counteroffensive might be possible with more weapons and training, the sources said, but Russia may also have an opportunity to replenish its forces in that time. So there are no guarantees, of course. Of course, Russia possesses a, a larger military industrial base. They can replace their losses. They're losing fewer men and machines, and they have a greater capacity to replace men and machines. Uh, it's the exact opposite for Ukraine. And it's, and it's NATO allies. So finally, the article says, 
As CNN has previously reported, Russia is looking in particular to exploit the gap between how much Soviet-style ammunition Ukraine and its allies have in their stockpile and how long it will take the West to provide Ukraine with modern NATO standard weapons and munitions that require time-consuming training. But that, that gap is actually a, at least a couple of years, one or two years at, at the least. I pointed this out many times. When Ukraine decided to purchase Bayraktar TB2 drones from Turkey, it took them two to three years to bring them into the country, train up on them, set up all of the infrastructure needed to support them, uh, train the operators, test them out, test fly them under different conditions, and then finally employ them on the battlefield. And even after all of that, and I would say they, uh, Ukrainian operators are effective operating TB2 drones. They're just uh, an inappropriate weapon system to put up against Russian air defenses, they have made absolutely no difference on the battlefield during this conflict. And this is a problem that is going to translate across all of these platforms Ukraine is trying to integrate into its military. That was just one drone system. It took two or three years to integrate into Ukraine's military. Ukraine's talking about integrating every type of system imaginable because all, all of the systems they started this conflict out with have been wiped out. So we're talking tanks, armored vehicles of every kind, drones, aircraft, air defenses, rockets, everything. They're going to try to integrate all of this into their army in the middle of a war, and they also need to train all of their personnel to use it. Not gonna happen, it's not going to happen. Now finally, last article is this one from Reuters. Missiles strike Ukraine shopping mall, G7 vows to keep pressure on Russia. Now I'm going to talk about the G7, uh, the the missile strike on the shopping mall. Again, this is Ukraine saying this. Ukraine lies about everything. They have zero credibility. I have to wait and see uh, evidence before I draw any conclusion on that. Uh, so what does the G7 say? First of all, the G7. These aren't even the seven largest economies on earth. Just at face value, it's an empty organization. Everything they say and do, therefore, what substance does it have? This is what they say. We will continue to provide financial, humanitarian, military, and diplomatic support and stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. That was a G7 statement. That's what they said. And why would the G7 even need to say something like that? Who are they trying to convince? Are they trying to convince Ukraine that they're going to continue standing by this, their side? Are they trying to convince Russia that they're not going to back down? Are they trying to convince themselves because doubt is starting to creep in? This is the type of thing that you say, you, you say it specifically because it is so obvious to everyone looking at this situation that Ukraine is losing. They're going to lose. Nothing can really change that. And the only rational thing for the West to do is to to stop, stop supporting Ukraine, find an off-ramp. That's the only reason they would say this. So we're gonna keep going because everyone can see how obvious it is that they should stop doing it. That is the only reason why. And you know what else? This reminds me of all of the things the, the US in particular was saying to the client regime in Afghanistan right before they pulled up stakes and abandoned them and the client regime collapsed overnight. Reminds me of that exactly. You, you say these things specifically because everyone can see that it's the exact opposite. I will continue keeping an eye on the situation in Ukraine. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Hit the notification icon, the little bell. It'll let you know when I upload a new video. Check the video description below, especially if you're watching this on YouTube, so you can see other places you can find and follow my work, just in case YouTube deletes my channel. I'm on Telegram, I'm on Odyssey, I'm on Rumble. All of my work is backed up on those two latter platforms, and Telegram is what I use instead of Twitter and Facebook, because I've already been kicked off of those platforms. In the video description below are all of the references that I used, as well as ways you can help support my work. You can do that through Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon. You could also do it through PayPal, but they have become very unreliable. Uh, only use PayPal as an absolute last resort if you cannot use any of the other options.
to everyone who has been helping out, whether it's one-time donations, month to month, or even if you're just sharing my work with others to help spread the word. I greatly appreciate all of that help. I could not do this work without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.